Good afternoon and welcome back to another episode of my workbench where today I'm hopefully going to start the process of changing my power supply options from a pile of old power adapters like this to an actual decent, well half decent anyway, benchtop power supply. Um, except this isn't actually a power supply, well it's half of one, kind of. Anyway, <laughs> I'll show you what I mean in a second. Um, so previously anyway, I've been using mostly just these, a various collection of these uh, adapter things, various different voltages, and a couple of multi-voltage ones, but obviously they're not great, you can't get negative voltage out of them, you can't get dual rail, there's no current limiting, they're not high current, and a bunch of other problems. Um, and so finally I decided to do something about that. Now, I picked this here um, off Trade Me for $2. Um, it's not the whole power supply at all, and in fact the keen observant of you may have noticed already that there aren't any knobs on the front or any LEDs, or any switches. Um, that's because this is basically an empty case. Well, not a completely empty case. We've uh, got the panel meters on the front anyway, uh, the binding posts, and at the back we've got the uh, power transistors and the heat sinks, and of course the front and rear panels and the case. So half of it's there. Um, there's no power cord that's been cut off. There is a fuse holder, um, which is nice. But there's no transformer and there's no printed circuit board or actual components. So I would need to get the uh, transformer I need to make a circuit board, I need to get the components, I need to uh, get the front panel switches and all that. Um, and hopefully after I do all that, this should actually be a working power supply. Um, and that should be good. So I've printed out the um, manual for this, which I've downloaded off the internet. And I'm going to go through some stuff today. Basically I'm just going to check out that the uh, panel meters are working fine. And I'm going to check to make sure the uh, rear transistors aren't shorted or anything like that. Um, so first of all I'm just going to open this up and we can have a look and see what's going on inside. So here's the inside and of course there's nothing in it. <laughs> because it's all been taken out. Um, but I'd say, uh, considering the uh, size of the case, considering the heat sinks, the transistors, the panel meters, if all this stuff's good, it's a pretty good value for $2. And I'll have to buy a transformer for it and make up a board myself and everything, but uh, that is a definitely a significantly reduced cost compared to what, would, what I'd have to pay to get the entire thing. Um, anyway, so hopefully that'll work. So like I said, uh, first of all I'm just going to basically test these out and see if they if they're okay, check the transistors, and then I'm going to use this as an excuse to uh, make a vid bunch of video series on making a printed circuit board from scratch and doing all that, um, which as you may have noticed with my previous video, um, I already started that process going and scanning the uh, board layout, well it's not actually in this, but uh, scanning the board layout for this and uh, converting it to a vector file and uh, getting it ready to um, to make, so that'll be um, part of this whole thing. But anyway, uh, power supply itself um, is a dual tracking power supply. It does up to 40 volts in single rail mode. Um, obviously it's adjustable negative 20 to positive 20 in the dual rail mode. Um, up to 3 amps. They claim uh, apparently the original transformer spec for this was only 2 amps, so I'm not entirely sure how that makes sense. Um, but obviously you can get a better transformer to put in it yourself um, if you wish to. In fact they even say that in the uh, final page. They say you can put a better transformer in and all that. It's also got adjustable current limiting, it's got a overheat protection, it's got a uh, zero volt rail and a separate earth terminal apparently, which um, quite useful. It also has a uh, dropout indicator in case you are uh, overloading the supply and the uh, ripple is getting too high. And uh, that's about it. So hopefully it'll be quite useful. It should certainly be a lot more useful than uh, a bunch of these anyway and a bit more convenient and I can put it up here somewhere and uh, have it right in the uh, right on the bench here instead of uh, having these strewn all over the floor. Um, yes, so that would be uh, much more useful than uh, what I apparently have. But anyway, on to actually testing this thing. Okay, so I've got a really simple little test circuit uh, set up for these meters. Um, 
I've just got a 3.3 volt supply here um, running through a 50k potentiometer with a 2.7k resistor in series to limit the maximum current and I've got a uh, ammeter set to 2 milliamps uh, measuring the current through so I uh, can see if these are calibrated or see if they are basically roughly what they should be. Um, so these are 1 milliamp FSD which is full scale deflection which basically means that when the pointer is over in the far right side there should be a equal to about 1 milliamp current flowing through the meter coil. Um, so basically I'm testing to see if the thing can deflect fully, um, if it moves freely, uh, make sure the uh, current matches up basically for what it should be. Obviously these uh, scales here, the uh, volt and uh, current scales, um, they're not the original ones, they're uh, ones that were made for this particular circuit for this power supply. Um, so uh, that doesn't matter as long as you uh, know what the current is through the meter and you have everything calibrated then you can put whatever you want on it. Uh, so anyway, so I'm just going to turn this on. I've got this uh, on the lowest setting, um, which won't be, uh, unfortunately, won't be zero milliamps because I'd have to go advanced circuit to uh, get that. But um, I'll just use a basic thing; it should be right. And we'll see. We get about 0 0.07 milliamps. Um, so I just want to check to see if the uh, scale kind of makes sense. So if we get halfway, it should be about 0.5 milliamps. So if I just wind this up slightly, it should be a bit hard because this is probably a logarithmic pot. Um, so I've got to make sure not to go too far. Um, there we go. Okay, so halfway it's about 0.43, which is uh, makes sense. I mean, these things aren't super accurate. Um, they're going to be cheap meters, and uh, that's not too bad. So if we go to up to the 40, we should see about twice that, so about 0.88 or 0.9. Um, so let's keep going. Yeah, so 0 0.9 is about double of what it was halfway, so um, we got the uh, scale here, it seems, seems linear, it seems correct. If I push it to uh, 1 milliamp, you see it goes uh, right to the end there. And it doesn't matter that this is uh, not completely accurate, obviously, as long as it's linear, roughly enough, then you can use a trim pot in the circuit to adjust for um, however this works, so that's fine. Um, so basically we've got full scale deflection basically right now, and then if I turn this off we see it flips right back to zero, turn it on, goes up full, turn it off. Um, so I mean basically yeah, the meter movement moves freely, there's no sticking, there's no weirdness, it basically works perfectly fine um, as you'd expect, and the adjustment is smooth, everything looks good, so you know, basically this uh, meter looks like it's working perfectly fine. Um, obviously these are quite delicate, which is the disadvantage to analog meters. Uh, if you drop them, or you overvolt them, or you reverse voltage them, you can you can easily damage them. Um, if you try and open them up, if you get dust in the in the spring there, it's a very fine spring. Um, it can be easily damaged and uh, things like that. So they it's worth testing it out to make sure it actually works. Um, but it seems fine. Uh, obviously they do have an advantage over digital meters, which if you uh, look at that, if I wind this back up to maximum again, um, we see how the, if you compare the digital readout to the analog one when I turn this off and on, you see how the uh, analog meter is so much faster than the uh, digital one. I mean this is a, an old multimeter and it is slow anyway, but um, to get something that fast, as fast as this, or at least um, to show, I mean, if I vary this voltage, you know, it's very quick to respond, and it's very obvious when something's varying, uh, exactly how much it's varying, and, and, and where it's varying too, whereas it's not so obvious with the uh, digital meter, because the digital meter takes a, a while to catch up um, with what it's doing, so it's not very obvious uh, straight away. So th these are, uh, give you more, better idea, it's, it's, it's at changing voltages than a digital meter can sometimes, um, although obviously digital meter is uh, more accurate um, in terms of actual digit digits, but um, you know, depending on what you're doing, uh, sometimes an analog meter can be um, a better choice for some applications. Um, so anyway, but uh, that proves that that one there works, so um, let's try the second one. And just, uh, plug this here. So, put this back to off, turn it on, and 
once again to do the same thing. So I'll go to about halfway. You get 0 0.44 again, pretty much exactly the same. And we could have a look at these uh, scales. We got 0, 1, 2, 3. So we could go to like 1 here and we get 0.3. Go to 2, we should get 0.6. Yeah, pretty much that. And go to 3, we should get 0.9, um, which we almost do, 86. It's close. Yeah, I mean, it seems fairly fairly well done. So, again, we can do this same test. We can turn it all the way up to about 1 milliamp and then turn it on and off. And the uh, needle does swing nice and freely, nice and quickly. Nothing weird going on there that I can see. So, uh, yeah. Looks like it's uh, working just fine as well, so that's good. Um, these would be quite expensive to buy if I had to get these, so the fact that I got them for $2, along with everything else, is uh, pretty good. Uh, so next thing I will check uh, the output uh, power transistors and just make sure they're not shorted or anything. Okay, so now to test the uh, output transistors, which are mounted on the back of the uh, case here with a couple of heat sinks. Um, we've got a MPN one here and a PMP. Uh, 2N3055 and it's complementary type which is an MJ2955 and these are very common transistors that you can still buy just about anywhere um, and they've uh, been around for ages. These are the uh, TO3 style package which has two pins coming out, you can see those here uh, through these holes and the third connection is actually the case of the transistor, uh, the collector um, which has been connected through with these uh, nuts, bolts, and uh, we got these uh, solder tags here, so um, that's why there's a little insulating washer between the um, connection and the uh, heatsink, because you may not wish to have the uh, the case of the transistor connected to the heatsink, just as you would with the uh, TO220 package, which has the uh, metal tab and everything. So these are probably isolated with the insulating washer on the other side, um, so that the collectors don't short out to each other through the uh, metal of the heat sinks, because that wouldn't be very useful. So um, I'm just going to do a simple test with these, basically, just to see if the uh, transistor junctions are coming up okay, making sure nothing's shorted, nothing's open. Um, oh, and uh, this transistor here is um, part of the thermal detection circuit. They're using it as a kind of uh, diode, I think, um, by soldering these two pins together and uh, just having two connections. So the uh, voltage drop across this will vary depending on the temperature and they can use that to uh, sense in case the uh, thing starts to overheat. Um, it doesn't look as if this is uh, very tight on the heatsink though, so um, this, this insulating pad seems to be preventing it from going all the way down, so there's not going to be very good thermal contact with that at all. Um, so I'm probably going to have to take this whole thing apart. Anyway, I want to clean all the uh, old heatsink paste off that's um, ended up stuck all over this back panel anyway, because it doesn't look very good and it's annoying to get on your fingers and stuff. So um, after this, I'll, I'll take the whole thing apart and clean everything off. Anyway, so on to actually testing these. So the uh, in both cases, the uh, collector will be this uh, thing here. So for the NPN, we can uh, connect that to negative and we should be able to, the base is the top pin so we should get a diode voltage drop between those two um, hang on anything this one Have I got this around the wrong way I mean, that doesn't make any sense, that's between it says collector and emitter, but maybe he's uh, installed the transistor upside down. In which case, that would be the base. So that was the base. If we swap these around, it should have nothing. And it doesn't. Okay, so if that's the base there, then this uh, should be the emitter here. Uh, yes, we get a diode drop across that. Okay, and nothing the other way. 
So between emitter and collector we should get nothing both ways with the probes. And we don't. So that looks good. So he's uh, uh, seems to have just installed the transistor and um, swapped 180 degrees from the way shown in the uh, kit manual. So um, instead of being instead of being the uh, emitter, this should be the emitter on this pin. But he's he's put it upside down. So this is actually the base pin. Um, I mean this this one here that I'm connecting the positive probe to is the base and the negative is connecting to collector. So that's good. So base collector, base emitter, um, all those, those junctions work out fine. They have the correct forward voltage drop that you'd expect. Um, and they've got nothing in the reverse direction and between collector and emitter there is no no connection at all, which is as it should be. So and that one seems to be uh, coming out okay. So that's our that's Q1 should be, and then over here we've got Q2. Oh, sorry, Q4 actually. They uh, designate that as Q4, and that's a PNP. So we should have the uh, positive on the collector this time, and this should be the base if it's around the right way. Uh, yes, it is. Four seven. And that should be the emitter. We get nothing, so that's good. And if I swap it around the other way, we should get nothing here. We should still get nothing here. And between the um, emitter and the base, we should get another voltage drop, which we do in that direction, which is correct and uh, swap the probes around we get nothing so that's good that checks out fine as well so um, those two transistors are most likely fine um, obviously this is a you know not a, not a load test it's just a very quick test but it shows us that uh, the transistors are not shorted they're not open um, yeah they, they should be fine again I mean it doesn't t test the breakdown voltage it doesn't test for leakage um, so it's not a comprehensive test but in general, these kind of things usually fail, either short or open. Um, so, just doing a quick test like this is probably enough. Um, yeah, but of course, be aware that just because uh, a transistor does test out fine with a basic multimeter check doesn't mean that it's not leaky and doesn't mean that the breakdown voltage may have uh, fallen below what it should be um, due to possible over overheating damage or just old age or something like that. So. Um, it is worth worth mentioning that uh, the just using a multimeter to test the uh, junctions between the base emitter and base and collector is is not enough to guarantee 100% that the transistor is okay, but it's uh, it'll get you you know mo most of the way there. And if anything looks odd when you're doing this test, then you know either just swap the transistor for a new one or 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 do some more extensive testing if you want to. Um, be sure. And another thing, though, to to worth mentioning is these are just plain uh, bipolar transistors, so they're just the same as any other ones. They're just high power ones in a big package. But uh, some some transistors, um, obviously, could be Darlington types. They won't measure the same. Obviously, MOSFETs are completely different. Uh, but there are some some transistors which are used for certain things like motor drives or for um, in the uh, deflection circuitry and horizontal circuitry of um, of a CRT TV or monitor that uh, can have inbuilt resistors inside the case and extra diodes and things like that so uh, it's worth noting that if you do a test on transistors like that uh, with the multimeter you can get false readings of, of leakage or shorts between pins um, that aren't really there because you're actually measuring a, a a resistor that's inside the transistor package as well. Uh, so it's just worth worth noting that if you um, are getting some strange readings, it is worth looking up the data sheet if you don't have it already, and uh, making sure it's actually not just a transistor with inbuilt resistors or, or diodes or such that um, you're not just getting confused with that. But in any case, um, I've got what I came for. These seem to be fine, and 
that's pretty much all there is. Okay, so while you weren't looking, I went and uh, took the heat sinks off the case, and I took the transistors off the heat sinks, and I took everything else off the transistors, and I cleaned up the copious amounts of thermal paste that had been slathered all over them. Um, <laughs> which, uh, I must admit, I was guilty of at one point. Um, when I built my first computer, I put far too much heatsink paste all over the CPU and wondered why it overheated. Uh, but yeah, um, a good point to note that. Um, if you are doing a computer build, or a build like this, power supply or amplifier or whatever, um, more thermal paste is not a good thing. Uh, basically, the thermal paste is designed just to fill in the small gaps, the imperfections, um, you know, just like rough, slightly rough edges left by sanding and, and stuff like that. You know, a very, very, very small level, microscopic possibly. Um, it's just meant to fill in small little cracks like that and just provide something to uh, reduce, uh, take away any air gaps and make sure that there's uh, a, a better, basically just more thermal transfer than, than air. Um, but if you start putting too much on, it actually becomes worse again. So no thermal compound is bad, too much is bad. You need just, just a uh, very thin amount, just enough to get in the little cracks and everything. Um, the funny thing is, though, <laughs> it's kind of sad to say this, but um, that's not the only bad thing that this guy did uh, when he put these together. Um, not only did he put too much heatsink paste on, he also only put it on one side of the insulating washer, the uh, electrical insulating washer. This is a mica washer. It's just for electrical insulation. It's, uh, obviously, you wouldn't use this if you didn't need it because it does uh, increase the thermal resistance. Um, but obviously, you know, like I said, these two transistors are uh, completely different opposite rails, different sides of the circuit. If these were um, connected to these heat sinks and the heat sinks were connected together, um, their collectors would be shorted together and basically shorting out the entire power supply rails to each other. So um, that doesn't really work. <laughs> or at least not if you don't want to blow fuses all day and set things on fire, potentially. Um, so, yeah, they do have to be electrically insulated from the heat sinks, or the heat sinks electrically insulated from each other, or, or whatever. Um, but yeah, uh, so yeah, too much heat, heat sink paste, only on one side of the washer, which doesn't really make sense. But uh, even worse than that, he uh, installed the transistors with only one screw. So what that basically means is that the transistor will be tilted up slightly off the surface of the heat sink, because it's being pulled down... You know, the transistor's like this, instead of being flat and being pulled down on both sides, it'll be pulled down on one side and it'll be tipped up slightly. I mean, obviously not that much, but, you know, there'll be a gap between on one end, so the uh, thermal transfer will be even worse because of that. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, he basically did three things wrong. Uh, just, just about everything wrong, really, um, when he mounted these on the, on the heat sinks, so um, that's not a very good... <laughs> good thing to do, but hey, learn from your mistakes, and anyone watching this will uh, hopefully learn from that too, and they'll know not to do that. Um, oh yes, actually there was a fourth thing, I should say. <laughs> Maybe not not terrible, um, but the uh, holes he drilled in the heat sinks, um, maybe not on this heat sink, this heat sink's okay, but um, this one here, he didn't uh, didn't deburr one of the holes. Yeah, this one here, this this bottom hole, um, this particular one here, it's still got some rough edges, I can feel, so um, that's, uh, you should, you know, get a countersink bit or a larger drill bit and uh, deburr all that or, or sand it down or something, because um, little spiky bits of metal like that around the hole, that's uh, great for punching through your insulating washer. Um, obviously, you know, in this case, it's it's pretty, pretty mild and, and probably wouldn't have been a problem. Um, and, and I couldn't actually see any holes in this. It's it's slightly cracked, but there's you know there's no well that could be why it's slightly cracked, but there's no you know giant gaping hole or anything. So um, it's probably not a short circuit straight through there. But you know it's a good thing just to make sure there's no rough rough bits after drilling or machining or whatever if you're doing something to the heat sinks. Um, you don't want rough bits of metal to, to break through that, especially if, you know, these were actually, I mean, you know, this is going to be running 30 volts or something on the secondary side of the transformer, but if you were doing this, you know, if these were high power transistors, if they were connected direct to mains side or other high voltage thing, I mean, you're not going to want to have anything like that that could possibly damage your, your insulating washers or anything, um, or your silicon pads or whatever you're using, so definitely make sure your heat sinks are nicely well 
well cleaned up and there's no rough edges on them. But anyway, um, so yeah, just, just uh, something to note there. Um, apart from that though, I guess there's not much else I can do right now. Um, but like I said, uh, the meters work, the transistors work. So at this point I shall say it's good to proceed, it's uh, certainly worth it, and its uh, next point will be to buy a transformer. <laughs> But yeah, that's about it for this video. Um, I'll uh, make a few more, progressing through the uh, stages of building this, putting it together. Um, like I said, I'll, I'll use this as an excuse to make a, a video series on producing circuit boards at home. And hopefully this power supply will be uh, up and running uh, in short order, and I can stick it up here or something and uh, actually use it. Oh so yeah, um, stay tuned for that, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>